start. Now, things are being stolen. Corporations are all of a sudden people. We the people. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delp. Today we have two, ho two uh, excuse me, two hosts, two guests. Uh, Dave King. Dave is a member of the Portland Jobs with Justice and has been an active member of many unions, uh, including having served as the chair of the political committee of the AWPPW, which is the Association of Western Pulp and Paper Workers, See. all right, as well as other posts. And he's usually here in the studio as well, but usually on the other side of the cameras uh, as part of our crew. So welcome to Dave. Uh, our other guest today is Ted Gleichman. Ted is the chair of the uh, LNG committee of the Oregon chapter of the Sierra Club and also a member of the steering committee of Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy. And this is a return visit for you, so welcome again. Thank you, pleasure. Good, good. right. So we want to talk about the environment, the climate crisis, and job cre creation. And so tell us what, what's, what's happening with the environment right now. Well, it's uh, the way I see it is we're living in a science fiction story where we're we're just destroying our beautiful spaceship, Earth. Um, if you look at the pictures of the Earth, you see just the thinnest little skim of white or light color around it, and that's our atmosphere. The Earth is about eight thousand miles. Th across and the atmosphere is about six miles deep. Hmm. I mean, it fades, but it, what you can breathe, Mount Everest is hard to breathe, so that's six miles up. Uh -huh. And, uh, and we're, we're destroying it. And the question is, how can we be doing that? How can that happen? And the answer is corporations, <laughs> uh -huh. I think. Um, corporations have, uh, they've, they've pretty much gotten control of everything in our society and a lot of the planet. And the way a corporation is structured does that. They're, uh, they're, they're organized to, to go after the maximum profit, and they have to do that. They're, uh, they're legally required. The executives of corporation are legally required to chase the profit. Uh, and then they have their bottom line, uh, their, their stock values are based on quarterly reports. And if they lose stock value to other corporations, which there's a little competition, not a lot, there's only a few corporations, but there's a few, then, then those, those executives get replaced by people who are more ruthless. Yeah. So you're really talking about the, the big mega corporations, the multinational, yep. the national corporations, not the little corporations no. that might be working here in Portland, and that's, that's the right. only place that, yeah. that, that they exist. Yeah, I'm talking about the one hundredth of one percent. Uh -huh. the, the, and, and they run things. They, oh, yeah. they have gotten to where they've got control over the media and the political political structures to where they pretty much run things. Um, you know, there's examples where people um, differ from what corporations want to do in a lot of ways, like, a, you know, privatization of, of things, like post office, for instance, or, or Social Security. But our government is moving right on down the line uh -huh. to do what people, you know, 80% of the people don't want. There, and they're investing heavily in Asia, heavily in Asia. And they're not investing in this country. And they're ship, that's why they're shipping coal, liquefied natural gas, and, and uh, tar sands oil to Asia because Asian economy is booming. Mm -hmm. And this. Uh, and so the, the reason it's booming is because those same corporations, many, many of which we identify as being American corporations, have turned into multinationals, yes. and they don't really have a specific reason to assist our economy in no. its recovery. Right, exactly, yeah. They're out for wherever wherever labor's cheapest, wherever they can make the most money, that's where they go. Uh -huh. And they abandon where they've left. Right, and, and I know one of the things that you have worked on, because I know you 
pretty well, <laughs> <laughs> is with regard to these free trade agreements. Right. And those free trade agreements have been the, the vehicle that has allowed those corporations to stop being concerned about what happens in America and be concerned about uh, what happens to their bottom line exclusively. Yeah, and, and you know, example of their control, Obama ran as a really questioning the trade agreements and mm -hmm. the export of jobs while he was a candidate. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he was in office, he started fighting. And 80% of the people are, are with Obama, <laughs> that's why we elected him, on the trade issue as a candidate. But then now he's, he's a, a free trader from the word go. He got three trade agreements approved in, in Latin America, and he's going for a huge Asia, Asia thing. Oh, right, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah, the export of coal is, uh, I have a, a picture here uh -huh. of the export of coal, and uh, this is from the Tribune. This is Boardman, this top dot. It's actually a coal car. The second, the two here, are all the emissions in Multnomah County. And all the rest of this is what they're, they're planning to export to Asia through here. So that's the plan. Um, nobody here wants it. Nobody really wants it. It's a few jobs, so some, some workers are you know, looking at it as jobs. I think they're jobs. They're, they're just like jobs unbolting a paper mill to send it to Asia. Mm -hmm. And it's a job, yeah, but what's it cost? Uh -huh. But anyhow, um, so what's going on with the climate? Well, when we had a chance to talk uh, on your March 25th show, David, oh. I, I talked a little bit about the transition on fossil fuels that had occurred. Uh, we've passed a key tipping point. Fossil fuels have been pretty much wonderful for us, with the exception of mercury in the tuna fish and the occasional horrific oil spill. But they've given us all of industrial society. But we've gone past the tipping point now where that has become a crisis uh, that is moving as a slow motion catastrophe most of the time, except when it comes to extreme weather, which is where most people are understanding the climate crisis now most deeply. Uh, since we spoke, uh, the, the first true scientific poll has been done in the United States around extreme weather, and 70% of the people of the population understands that global warming and climate change um, are a function of e extreme weather creation, that this is happening as a result. Uh, the most interesting statistic out of that is more than a third of the people in this poll, 35% have actually experienced an extreme weather event. Mm. And many of us now in Oregon fall into those kinds of, of categories uh, with the flooding that has occurred and so on. In many parts of the country, the droughts uh, that have occurred. Uh, and we're going to see more and more impact on all of the uh, functions by which our planet has survived. Dave, you've spoken about the, the thinness of our atmosphere. I mean, we look at the sky and think, how could we possibly be affecting that with our behavior? But we're putting 90 million tons of carbon uh, into the atmosphere every day. Uh, and th we've passed the limits on what the, the, the system can cope with. Another way to look at it is is we've dumped carbon from millions of years of sunlight shining on Jurassic swamps in the last hundred years. Millions of years exactly. of, yep. of, of carbon. Yeah. And, and so, and we've released that into the atmosphere, yes. is what you're saying. Yeah, right. we've dumped oh, it yeah. in the atmosphere. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I like to cite um, ice because this, this is a book called Extreme Ice Now from a, a a group in Colorado uh, at the University of Colorado called uh, the Extreme Ice Project, where they place cameras all around uh, the uh, some of the key glaciers uh, and uh, Antarctic uh, and Arctic positions where you can actually see what's going on. You know, ice is not a computer model; it's a fact on the ground. It's something that's actually happening, and glaciers are retreating 
uh, all over the world in a, in a really catastrophic way. I mean, Glacier National Park is going to need to be renamed at some point because the 150 glaciers that were uh, in that park when it was established as a national park, they're now down to 25. Two have been lost in just the last four years, and uh, they're continuing to shrink quickly. And again, not a computer model. It's a fact on the ground, just like extreme weather, just like the increase in tornadoes and so on. So looking at the evolution of the climate and the changes that we've made in our climate systems, why would we want to make that worse by exporting fossil fuels like coal and natural gas, which is methane? Um, our March 25th conversation uh, covered a lot of that ground. Right. Uh, a, a, a severely damaging climate gas. Uh, we need to look at the transition and the good news out of this is that renewable energy is here and ready for prime time. The economics work, work the, um, the technology works, and the opportunity is there if we can make it work quickly and properly in a way that allows us to protect this evolution of climate that's already started. Yeah. So, so we have the ability to do that, but we don't have the politics to do it. That's correct. Exactly. Right. That's yes. exactly Why don't we right. have the politics to do that? Well, uh, corporations is is a big part of it. The other part of it is is we're not we're not that well organized. Um, when, you, when you say we, people. What we okay, people, people versus corporations. Yeah. Uh huh. Just back on the global emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning jumped sixty percent. Six. In Oh, 6% <laughs> in 2010. In one year, 6% increase in the global burning of fossil fuels. There was a little decline after the Great Recession started. And so there was some hope among climate scientists and people who are concerned about these issues yeah. that there might be a, a little bit of a window to get back. I mean, the, the best science is that 350 parts per million, really a very tiny amount of carbon dioxide, offers a stability scenario for the planetary climate. Right now we're at 393, so we're already well above that 350 figure. Um, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, we were at 250. So uh, we've gone up you know, quite a lot, and we continue to rise. And so this, this information from 2010 that the carbon output went up by 6% from uh, 2009, is very bad news for what's going on currently mm -hmm. in terms of the global economy. Yeah, yeah just uh, you know, talking about books, there's a book called uh, called The Storms of Our Children. Are you both mm -hmm. familiar with mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. James Hansen, James Hansen, America's Hansen. leading climatologist. Oh, right. And he talks about this uh, small uh, band of, of, of favorable environmental conditions that allows the human society as we know it to exist, right. and when you get outside of that, uh, and you get to the position of having environmental chaos, uh, then life as we know it ceases to exist. It doesn't say life ceases to exist, but what we have known and right. what we have grown yeah. comfortable with ceases to exist, yeah. and that's what we're really talking about. Yeah, right. people are talking about the, the starting to talk about the end of civilization. Uh -huh. um, and it's not a long way off. I have a, mm. a 94 year old father in law and a one-year-old grandson. Now, if my grandson lives to my father-in-law's age, he will see 2105. So when you talk about catastrophic changes by 2030 or by the middle of the century or by the end of the century, that's really only one degree of separation from our generation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's slow on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I had a conversation uh, a few days ago with a woman from Boston who said March 1st they had two feet of snow in Boston. Less than a week later she was out on her deck um, in 85 degree weather in a tank top and she said and it felt wonderful and it felt so wrong yeah. at the same right. time. Yeah. Uh -huh. 15,000 records were broken just in the United States just in March of this year. Mm -hmm. In terms of high temperature yeah. records uh -huh. for climate yeah. change. So um, I have a quote from, uh, from Richard Trumka. Who is the president, 
president of the AFL-CIO and uh, labor being a key issue in terms of the labor that we need for the jobs to fix these issues. So he was speaking in January of this year to the United Nations Investor Summit on Climate Risk. Today, as we meet together, scientists tell us that we are headed ever more swiftly toward irreversible climate change with catastrophic consequences for human civilization. We must have a stable climate to feed the planet, to ensure there is drinking water for our cities, but not flood waters at our doors. A stable climate is the foundation of our global civilization, of our global economy, the prerequisite for a profitable investment environment. Addressing climate risk is not a distraction from solving our economic problems, my friends. Addressing climate risk means retooling our world. It means that every factory and power plant, every home and office, every rail line and highway, every vehicle, locomotive and plane, every school and hospital must be modernized, upgraded, renovated, or replaced with something cleaner, more efficient, less wasteful. Okay. So that gets us to, uh, to jobs. Yeah, and the, the importance of this statement is that, is that typically environmentalists are uh, positioned opposing uh, workers. Right. Right, and job creation. So uh, the importance here is that the president of the AFL-CIO, you know, the embodiment of American labor, has said that the way you increase jobs is to attack these problems with regard to the environment. That's right. right. That's what he's exactly saying. Exactly right. He's not. <laughs> okay, I have to put a qualifier in there. He he says that he says really good stuff, and he he understands it. But at this point, there isn't the rank and file push yet, and that's what. But that's you're working what we, on that. Yeah, I'm working right. on that. That's what we need to build is a uh -huh. is is that kind of a movement, mainly from workers and and young people because it's workers and young people that have the biggest stake in this. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of work are gonna, are, do we need to do? Um, there's three main categories, clean energy production, and that's like wind, solar, biofuels. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about solar, because solar's right in the hopper. If we move quickly, we can get a lot of jobs out of solar, and it'll make a big difference. Transportation, and that's urban mass transit and interurban uh, high-speed trains, get us out of airplanes. Airplanes are the worst way to travel for, oh, yeah. for throwing carbon in the air. Yeah, and I'll just interrupt you. The, the, other, the other point on the airplanes, of course, is that the major source of pollution from airplanes is from the military. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. And so we really right. need to Stop we really need military. to focus on right. cutting that military budget cutting the military. And, and, and the biggest threat, the military recognized the biggest threat to national security is climate change, uh -huh. not well, that's Arabs. That's true. <laughs> well, yeah. uh -huh. um, okay, and, so, and then the third thing, first clean energy production, transportation, tra and then conservation, weatherization, and rational manufacturing so that we're not throwing everything away that we build. Um, I, I used to repair cars and it's just ridiculous. Engineers spend most of their time, I'm sure, w designing parts that can't that have a bolt hole in a different place, so it can't be interchangeable sure. with another car. Uh -huh. um, so anyhow, those are the three main areas of work, and there's a lot of work that we can that we need to be doing in those areas. Um, the challenge you were asking, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah is the corporate lock on our government and media. The Citizens United, which have been campaigned in this program a lot, uh -huh. and campaign financing, and corporate media and education, they're totally locked by corporations. Right. Okay. And, and, and the Citizens United case, just for people who haven't been watching, can you give us a brief statement about what that is, or do you want me to? Or? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, Citizens United is the decision on the part of the Supreme Court that said that corporations, for the first time, are able to spend money on so-called independent campaigns with no limitations. And so we've seen this flood of, of, of uh, increased expenditures on, on campaigns. Um, yeah. 
The best government that money can buy. Right. Yes. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, and that that that's that's why this kind of a program is really important because and cable access is really important. And all kinds of other media are really people's media are really oh. important. And people I think a lot of people go to people's media. Mm -hmm. For information, or else we wouldn't have the movement that we have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and part of that is is programs well like this, as you say, mm -hmm. but also things like uh, Amy Goodman's Democracy Now. Yeah. Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah. And uh, uh, and then the uh, websites like Common Dreams and Alternet and those kinds right. of things mm -hmm. that give right. uh, yeah. non corporate uh, mm -hmm. perspectives. On the news. On the climate, there's a really excellent website um, called Climate Progress. Well, if you Google Climate Progress, climate you'll progress. get there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. .org. Yeah. So how well, can well, we? Well, let me hit a, a, yeah. qu a quick <laughs> issue around around <laughs> okay. money since we were talking around that yep. uh, that in in terms of campaigns, in terms of jobs, one of the key issues, of course, is how the work can be financed and how people's efforts can be financed, uh, and there's a couple of things that have been going on um, here in Oregon and in Portland that offer both a model and a, a, a bit of a lesson for the future. Uh, we have a, a, a nonprofit now in Oregon called Clean Energy Works Oregon. Sierra Club, where I'm affiliated, has uh, been one of the participants in this, and it, it developed out of Clean Energy Works Portland as a way of doing deep weatherization uh, and energy conservation in individual homes uh, started with financing from stimulus funds, uh, which you've discussed with uh, uh, the, Ro the Robin great Hanel, Robin Hanel, the, the uh, uh, uh -huh. radical economist from Portland State University. Uh -huh. uh, and the effort there is to provide people with a triple bottom line of reduced energy use, a more comfortable home because it's tighter and, and running more efficiently, um, and jobs for the people who are doing the work on a local basis. You can't actually outsource putting insulation in your attic uh, to Bangalore. So uh, not that people in India don't need jobs too, but there's, yeah. a, there's an opportunity yeah. here. But if, they, if they're going to do it there, they yes, would be exactly. employing their own people. Exactly, which would be and, excellent and they have real problems with coal as well, just like we do. So. Uh, this kind of program is being billed to the individuals through their utility bills. Now, there's some issues here, but it's basically the gold standard of financing uh, from the, the point of view of the financial community because utility bills have the lowest default rate of any type. Well, if the utilities were doing this with stimulus funding so they were at no risk, why aren't they doing it on their own initiative through the funding mechanisms that they have? If the Keystone Pipeline, which we talked about at some length, um, to run tar sands to Texas from Alberta, um, could be financed uh, for $7 billion, why can't we be financing the deep weatherization, the mm -hmm. clean energy production, the new transportation tactics? So these questions about control of the financial system and control of money become key to what we're trying to do. Yeah, and I think that uh, that the Occupy movement really opens the door and points the finger at at what the problem is. I mean, banks can they have all the money, like the bank robber said, and <laughs> and they control they control uh, credit, so they make that, those decisions. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get into into immediate immediate things that are happening. Yes, um, democratizing the grid. Feed-in tariffs. Those words don't make a whole lot of sense, but what the, what the way I describe it is, um, if w it's a program that they use in Germany that's that's making Germany so solar intensive that they that they uh, they're getting off nukes next year mm -hmm. or two years from now. Very soon. Yeah, but really soon. And what it is is that it's a program where you if you put a solar array on your roof now, um, it just, if you use, you don't have to, like my, I have put one on last year and we're not paying an electric bill. We just pay for the grid, 10 bucks a month for the grid. In Germany, 
I'd be getting 100 bucks a month off my roof. I'd be selling that electricity to the utility back to the, back to the grid and everybody would be putting one on their roof because they, right. it pays for the expense of putting it on and, and, and it's not taxpayers paying for it. It's, it's paid for by, the, uh -huh. by the, the energy you, you make. So the term feed-in tariff comes from you're feeding, feeding electricity into the grid and the utility pays a tariff to you as the person providing that electricity. Thank for you. the grid. Thank you. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that these programs go for solar, wind, biofuel, whatever. So a community can build a biofuel plant and, and uh -huh. burn corn yeah. husks and generate yeah. electricity. But the point, the, the other part of this is that rather than building, you know, nuclear power plants or building, you know, coal large, fired. Uh, you right. know, coal-fired coal plants or from building massive uh, wind farms in eastern Oregon, eastern Washington, or wherever you know, mm -hmm. folks are at, uh, these go on your rooftops in your communities. Right. Yes. Right. You don't have to build transmission lines, and people want to do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. The closer you can get the generation of electricity to the load that it needs to serve, uh -huh. the lower the cost, the less loss you have uh, in terms of that electrical generation mm -hmm. capacity. And where that's at is the governor has, is now designing a 10-year energy plan for Oregon. Um, at this point, or at last I heard, feed-in tariffs is not part of that energy plan. And he needs to hear from everybody uh, that it should be part of the 10-year right. energy plan. So the way to do that is go to the Oregon Renewable Energy policy website which is oregonrenewables.com and uh, I think it's dot org. No, or dot com actually. Dot com. Yeah, yeah I think but it's they com. decided on that because it was a more common usage. Yeah. Okay. So. And, uh, and you can learn a lot about the feed-in tariff and I'm sure there's a link there to, to get to the governor. Okay, great. Well, thank you both for being here. That's the our end pleasure. of our program. Great. Thanks Good. much, David. Right. Thanks, David. All right. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so we, we had a few graphics up there about uh, uh, additional information from the Blue Green Alliance, so bluegreenalliance.org, Oregon Sierra Club, uh, oregon.sierraclub.org. Uh, and then there's a good blog on the climate at climateprogress.org. There's also a workshop on jobs and climate on June 20th at the Musicians Union Hall at 6 p.m. Thank our crew today, uh, Roger Bates, Janet Morris, Joan Horton, Philip Jefferson, and Tom Thomas. And thank you all for being here. We hope you, we'll see you again next week. Bye.